With Brian and Rachel's mating results just over the horizon, we know episode three has been highly anticipated. And with pregnancy testing out of the way, we can sit down with Brian and Rachel to see how it really went, mating with Cow Manager. Today's the day. The results are in here at Brian and Rachel's. Let's see if Cow Manager has solidified its place at Greenleaf Pastures. Third and final uh, episode, catching up with you guys uh, going through the farming journey. So what was the takeaways from this year? How did you enjoy it? Well, I thought it went really well, actually. Um, there was a lot of speculation of what results we can achieve by going AI only, especially when we were getting um, single digit empty rates already. And the accuracy of the system, um, yeah, it actually kind of blew me away. Um, just how accurate it was, even when we're scanning, it was evident how accurately it picked up cows, how many cows were in calf to exactly when the system said they were. We ended up doing 11 and a half weeks of mating and had a 9.1% empty rate, which we were so stoked with. The same length of mating as last year. Yeah, so same length of mating um, and only had one more cow that was empty compared to last year, so it was 26 cows. Last year was 25, so I don't think there's much to, compl to complain about. We, was... we got to um, scanning and we were like, oh, it doesn't feel like we just did 11 and a half, oh, it doesn't feel like we had an 11 and a half week mating. Um, we couldn't really believe it, eh? How, yeah. how good and fresh we still felt. Um, yeah, I don't know. You can't, we couldn't describe the, the feeling. The one thing that I would say about mating and the technology is normally if you've got bulls out or if you're tail painting and stuff, um, you get to the end and you're not aware as as much as we were this year with the technology who's coming on heat. And so it was hard for me to draw the line of let's stop mating because I'm like, oh wow, I definitely know she's going to be empty then. And because we do DIY, we've got the semen. It's not hard for us to um, put them back up. Whereas, I don't know, if you've got bulls out, you just take the bulls out, they're on a truck, and what can you do? The mating's finished. So that was like the one thing I struggled with, drawing yeah. the line. That's what happens yeah. when you got too much information. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, when we first got together, and we were leading that weekend before mating, we had those 12 non-cyclers, and we decided to do nothing with them. What do you think you'll do different next year? There's a very small number of them uh, that did not cycle until quite late in mating. So I think we gotta just go back, look at the data, and then look as it was potentially intervening early, but then when you do it earlier, you have to do the whole mob. Whereas if you've done it later, you're only treating a small number of animals. And we don't wanna get into that slippery slope of using cedars in our herd. We just wanna stay no intervention um, well, no cedars anyway. So what I'm getting out of it is that, like, you know, mating, like, you've clocked it, you've done mating, it's mean you can move on from that, but your big focus is transition, and you think that that transition part from when they're dry into calving is going to have a big effect on your mating results? Mm, yep. Yeah, I would agree with that. I think mating doesn't start on your first day of mating. For us, we always view mating as it goes on all year round. We've got to make sure the cows are in good body condition score at the start, got to transition them well. Then as they calve, got to look after them through that crunch period, especially the following 10 days post calving, and then just get them performed in the herd because every cow's got to be a performer. We don't want passengers, and that's what we're trying to eliminate or minimise. Yeah, and I think um, we're thinking about how we can help the cows transition for mating, but there will also be milk production benefits of it that we can't um, properly calculate but they'll be there if we can transition the cows better why isn't why what's going to stop her from producing better so Rachel with you being with uh, an AB tech company for some time and being an AB technician how do you find it 
inseminating cows that a system's telling you are on heat or in, in heat? How do you find the changes of just not having a rock up and that just those cows being put there from a farmer? It's actually the data and the algorithms are telling you these cows are in heat. During mating, with what cow manager would say was on heat, sometimes I doubted the system personally because we had towel painted as well and I thought, surely not, you've got full towel paint. But we mated them and then obviously they must have been on heat because if you look back on the data, Brian just said before, we only had two cows that were already pregnant that we had inseminated again, and they were the sick two cows. So the other ones must have been on heat and must have conceived. Yeah, like we actually recorded that, who had tail paint when we put them up, and when we had scanning day, flicked back through, because that's a real curious thing we wanted to look at. And a large percentage of those had conceived, so there was no sign to the human eye, well, to our, to our eyes, and in the past we've thought we're reasonably accurate because we've got quite good results and these cows still conceived so yeah could have been knocked to our confidence yeah. eh? <laughs> so, so who, won? Of, who won well the farmer won at the end of the day <laughs> you won yeah at the end of the <laughs> yeah so <laughs> it was yeah it was really interesting um but yeah going forwards it gives us great trust in the system just to fully rely on it yeah and by the end we're doing that, especially in short gestation where we, are, where we do have a smaller herd as 280 cows and when you're trying to pick the ones or twos who might be on heat and then the sun comes out you've got heat stress and you've tail painted the cows and like normally we do and then they start whacking their tails and everything around flies, and a bit of flies yeah. or go stand under the shade and you just question tail paint and you spend normally quite a while looking at tail paint because either they're obviously on or they're kind of, well they are on but there's just minimal cows for that amount of bullying behaviour going on. So you really have to analyse the tail paint, whereas this year it was just wake up, boom, oh yeah, draft these two cows while you're milking, inseminate them, job done. I think actually we got to like week five and we needed to touch up the tail paint. You were like, alright let's go paint and I was kind of like, oh, I can't be bothered, really? Why? And you are like, no, we have to stick to it for the whole... I don't know, whole mating period, and definitely by the end I was sick of tail painting. <laughs> so next season, what are we doing? Tail paint, yes or no? No. no. So now that the season's finished, and we went through all that data and we looked at the cows that did finish up empty at the end of the day. Also throughout the season there was a couple of changes, you know, a couple of weeks in. Is it, did you notice anything as well? By the data? Oh, yeah, when I went back and analysed, um, week one and two conception rate of mating was like 20% almost down from the third week. From So week three we picked up and our conception rate in week three was 85. Um, yeah, some, about 85, somewhere plus or minus two. Whereas week one and two was 63%, I think it was. Wow. And we thought, well, what's happened there that it's picked up 20%? And what can we... Um, we need to analyse that further so that we can replicate that in other seasons because that's a huge gain for our business, getting more cows in that first three weeks because that's also our replacements. Yeah, and as we dove into that a bit more and looking at the rumination graphs and at 18 minutes say the rumination had gone up a fair bit at the same time which you could argue uh, like it's it's a bit hard to just pinpoint exactly but there is a lot of changes going on at that time and spring and pasture and everything and a few subtle diet changes but I think a key thing for next year would be like maybe having a look can we start hitting those higher rumination minutes and all that yep. type of targets a bit earlier and yeah how can we potentially if the grass isn't quite there can we manipulate it through our feeding system maybe or just analyzing that and just trying to get those targets and potentially get a higher conception rate because then if we have a higher conception rate that's going to save us a lot on semen and also increase our three week calving spread even more um yeah i think it's just getting down with those nitty gritty bits really to add more value to the whole system First year using Cow Manager, how have you found the service and support? I think it's confidently met the expectations. I think um, that is a point of difference and I know this is a Cow Manager video and 
this is what people would expect to hear. Paid presentation. <laughs> but um, we aren't also surprised by it because the reason why we went with Cow Manager before was that if we look in the market space of wearables, you look at how many companies you can actually pick up the phone to contact people for, for service and if you have any issues they'll have someone out on farm. You don't get that with many of the others and they say they do but the level and quality of service and the know-how of interpreting data just isn't there from what I find and also we have been following wearables for a number of years before getting this system and what we liked about Cow Manager was all the road shows, road shows they do like just throughout the season to obviously try and attract farmers to the system and show what they're about but also when you have the system there's a lot of well before mating there was that other road show they done and this, this invite only one for people with systems and they actually benchmark like all the relevant um, so like we're in the Tiamudu Cambridge area got all that data pool and actually benchmarked it to how you're tracking versus other herds and I think I think that level of service is just something money can't really buy because you can't you can't necessarily pay for something and expect to get all this knowledge that sometimes doesn't happen these days and the whole benchmarking thing especially here in the Waikato we did come out of a really tough winter period um, leading into spring too wasn't that flash so actually having the industry say yeah hit this target do this and that is completely sometimes different to what's actually going down on farm and having those pieces of paper seen where you can improve. I think all all that just adds a complete point of difference to the whole cow manager team. And yeah, I found the service great. Yeah, I think also when you'd come out, Jared, it challenged our thinking and made us look at what the system's telling us in more detail rather than kind of just get complacent and, you know, it is what it is, um, figure out why it's actually going wrong and what we need to do to fix the issue. It's like sometimes there's another eye watching over your system and generally there is somewhere and if something goes wrong you know about it pretty quickly. Anyone out there on the market looking for a wearable would you make, recommend Cow Manager? Yep yeah 100% yep. we've actually recommended it to a lot of people and also a few people have also got in contact with us um, and asked us more questions and information about the system and how it's performing and a lot of people have also actually brought the system so you have no problem at all recommending the system myself personally I would just say to people looking at getting wearables and specifically cow manager the system's great but it can be better if you listen to the data um, make changes from what it's telling you and improve your system as a result you can't just um, put it in and assume that's just going to do everything and your cows are just going to start cycling because of it you've got to listen to it and make these improvements to get them to cycle because of what the technology is telling you if you have to spend ages to interpret the information, you can't actually do it at a scalable level. And I think that's another point of difference why we went with the system, was just how easy the information is to interpret. It's literally got colour codes, what to do. And if you have staff on and you want to make cows, it's kind of like, yep, yeah, if they're light green or above, put them up type of thing. And all the mobile software is some of the best apps I've actually used to how fluid they are. And I think within like two or three touches, you can generally view a lot of information. Whereas on the other hand, I have also seen some systems, some wearable ones where you kind of are a bit more computer based. The reality is not everyone's carrying around a computer with them wherever they go. Well, they kind of are in a form of a mobile phone, so they've got to be mobile friendly. And I think there's some that I've seen that look like they're from the 1990 Windows and I think we're 2024, so that's not... You know, it's not attractive. Yeah, find a, um, a wearable that is moving with the times. Yes, what a result. Getting rid of tail paint is not an easy decision, and Brian and Rachel have done so well this season. We'd like to thank Brian and Rachel for their participation in this story, and we'd also like to thank Jared for his ongoing and excellent customer service. And thank you for following along and leaving your comments. 
For more information, go to cowmanager.com. This has been, and may well be again, Mating with Cow Manager.